Hey everybody, this is Doc G, also known as Jordan Grummet. Today is a really, really important day in my life. Tomorrow, Taking Stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life. It is book launch day, August 2nd. This is the culmination of pretty much all the content I've been creating since I started in about 2004, 2005, writing about medicine. It documents my personal beliefs, my journey through burnout in medicine to personal finance, and what I've learned from death and dying and being a hospice doctor and how it relates to money and life. Listen, the truth is, I really almost never ask for anything on this podcast. Making this podcast is my joy. But if you like what you hear when you listen to Earn and Invest, if you like these stories I tell at the beginning of each episode, I'd really like to encourage you to go to earnandinvest.com slash book or earnandinvest.com slash taking stock. That will direct you to Amazon. Go ahead and order the book. If you are struggling right now with the meaning of wealth and money and how that fits into your life, I believe this is the book for you. This is made for people who have found wealth, who have made money. Maybe they're approaching financial independence, but it's also for you if you're working on making sure you have enough money to buy dinner to put on the table tonight. What role does money play in our life? And how do we decide what living a life of true purpose, identity, and connections looks like? Please consider my book, Taking Stock. Again, earnandinvest.com slash book or earnandinvest.com slash taking stock. Now to the show where J.L. Collins takes over and interviews me about this book, the process it took to write it, and what it's all about. Take it away, J.L. This is Doc G, and you are listening to the Earn and Invest Podcast. And this is J.L. Collins, and I have hijacked the Earn and Invest Podcast today. We are turning the tables on Doc G. He is going to be not the interviewer, but the interviewee. I have the honor of interviewing him today because we're going to talk about his new book, Taking Stock. I've had the privilege of having an advanced chance to read it. I had a chance to write a blurb about it because I liked it so well. I'm excited to talk to him about it. I'm excited to introduce it to you, our listeners, and I'm looking forward to you having a chance to read it. But right now, we're going to, we're going to put the spotlight on Doc G and put him under the hot lights and make him answer a few questions. First of all, Doc, this is a hospice guide to dying and to financial advice around it. Death brings up an obvious question, legacy. So, Doc, what do you think your legacy is going to be? What do you want your legacy to be? So, obviously, JL, you are putting me on the hot seat. This is very reminiscent of one of the questions I asked you on one of the first times that I had you on the podcast. Legacy is a difficult question, and throughout my life, it's changed. When I was younger, I thought I wanted my legacy to be that I became famous, that I wrote the most read book, or that I changed something in medicine or developed a procedure. It's funny, as I get older, my sense of legacy has changed. Now, what really has become important to me is to have an effect and touch the people in my immediate vicinity, to live a life of intention and, in my sense, to practice a sense of ethics in which I can demonstrate those things that I think are most important to the people around me. I can be there for them. I can be guide and counsel. I can ask them for advice when I have issues. I've really started to think about affecting people locally more than globally and feeling like a rock thrown into a pond and the ripple effect continues throughout the whole pond. I'd like to make a change locally in the people close to me, those people I can touch directly, and hopefully that goodness will spread. So it's a very different feeling about legacy than I think I had in my younger years. Let me ask you another question, and this is maybe a little off topic from the book, 
But you are a hospice doctor. You have had the opportunity, maybe even the privilege, to be with people at the end of their life. What is death really like? What does death look like for the people who are looking it in the eye and facing it and who see it coming? There are a lot of people who, of course, die abruptly with accidents or what have you, but my sense is the kind of people you're dealing with see it coming and they have time to reflect on it. Is death hard for them? Is it difficult? Is it easy? Is it graceful? Is it all of those things depending on the individual? You know, it's funny you ask that question my feelings about death are so much different than they were before I practiced hospice medicine. Let me start with one caveat. People generally tend to die the way they lived. So people who are happy and comfortable and settled generally tend to die a death that's happy, comfortable, and settled. People who are anxious and upset during life, tend to be anxious and upset while they're dying. So some of it depends on who you are. What really has surprised me is before I started doing hospice medicine, I really was worried that death was something to fear. It was something uncomfortable. There would be pain. There would be anxiety. It would be a very fearful process. After sitting with the dying for years and years, I've realized that most deaths maybe eight or nine out of 10 are actually quiet and peaceful with family around. It's a lot more comfortable and natural of an experience than I thought it would be. So what I often tell people is I'm way more at peace with dying since being around it for the last 10 years than I ever was before. So it seems to me it's a process that's a lot less scary than most of us make it out to be. And so this common idea that people are afraid to die in your experience, really isn't true. When they're actually facing it, there's not so much fear in most cases. I would say that most of our fear surrounding death actually occurs throughout our life. And people generally way more commonly come to terms with death at the end. And that's a lot of what I talk about in the book. Actually, our fear of death drives a lot of behavior in life that's not really so healthy. And it's only when we're facing death in the face that we can start making decisions and start thinking about whatever life we have left in a way that's much more nurturing and deep and peaceful. And we get to decide what's really the most meaningful for us in whatever time we have left. I always find it interesting that we don't have that perspective when we're 20 or when we're 40 or even when we're 60 sometimes this knowledge that we're going to die within the next few weeks or months actually relieves us of letting go of all those things that don't matter and lets us begin to really think about what does matter. You know, it's, it's kind of what I hear you saying is that when we're younger and death is more of an unknown, it's, there's more fear around it. But as these people who actually are facing it get closer to it, that fear goes away because it's not perhaps as unknown as it as it was before. Let me let me roll back to our legacy question. We I don't think we can look at, at think about our own legacy without looking back to those who have come before us. So tell me about your dad. My dad was, and I say was because he died when I was seven years old. He was a physician who treated cancer patients or an oncologist, and. At the age of seven, I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to walk the way he walked. I wanted to talk the way he talked. And specifically, I decided at that age, I wanted to be a doctor just like him. So when he died suddenly, he had a brain aneurysm. It was something we couldn't have foreseen. He went to work one day with a headache and pretty much collapsed and died over the next day or two on life support. How old was he? He was 40 years old. Wow. Very young. He was. And that made really concrete in me this idea that I would become a doctor like him. I would fill his shoes somewhere, maybe even unconsciously. I thought I would continue his plan. And part of that was I just couldn't understand why this important man, this father of three young children, this beloved husband died. I didn't didn't have a reason for that. And as a seven-year-old, I certainly couldn't explain it. So the only thing that made sense to me, the story I could tell myself is that by stepping into his shoes, I could somehow cosmically make right this bad thing that happened. And this set me off on a journey to become a doctor at such a young age that in many ways, 
I didn't really know who I was as a person. I certainly didn't know what felt purposeful or had meaning for me. So I stuck with this thing that felt right, this legacy that my father left me. In many ways, it was a gift because at the time I had a learning disability. It was unclear if I was ever even going to learn how to read. I was able to overcome that. I went to high school with this beautiful sense of purpose and college and medical school. And I became a doctor and was allowed into people's lives to help them and to do something important. But strangely enough, as I walked this path as a physician, I started to burn out and realize that that sense of meaning and purpose that I had grown up with was fading. And I no longer felt connected to that doctor persona that had really been my identity for all those years as a young person. And it really left me in a state of panic, which is exactly when I discovered financial independence. Your dad dies at 40, very young age. He leaves behind a very young family. You were only seven. Did you worry as a family, as an individual, as a seven-year-old? Did you worry about money growing up? Was money a hardship for your family? Did your parents model money in any fashion to you overtly or, or, or maybe just through their behavior? You know, it's a great question. When my father died... And I don't even remember this, but my mom says one of my first questions is, what will happen if you die? So it was this interesting process where she had to go back and then start doing some estate planning and think about our well-being as children. Interestingly enough, my father always had a premonition he was going to die. And he told my mom this when he married her. He said, I think I'm going to die young. So a few things happened. One is he did not save for retirement. So there was not a lot of money in the bank, but he had a life insurance policy, which eventually paved the way for me to go to college and medical school. The other thing is he told my mom, you've got to this point in child rearing where you're getting restless. You should go back to the workplace when my mom stopped working, she was in the midst of getting a PhD in chemistry and working in a medical lab. She was thinking about going back and finishing off her PhD. And my father said, no, you should really do something where you can make some money because in case something happens to me, I want you to be okay. So instead, she applied for and went to business school at the Kellogg School of Business out of Northwestern. And when my dad died, she was a few months away from graduating with her MBA. She was doing a period of work at a Big Ten accounting firm, and they agreed to hire her when my father died. So when he died, he left us a life insurance policy, which paid for all three of his children's schooling, as well as a wife who was well on her way to getting a commanding salary as an accountant. So it was fortuitous. Maybe you would say it's lucky, or maybe it was really good planning. The downside or the upside of that is my mother was very careful with money. She always saved a lot of money. She started in a Big Ten accounting firm and then eventually started her own business. She remarried. My stepfather was an entrepreneur and started his own business. They both invested in real estate. They both invested in the stock market. And looking back, they both saved maybe 50% of their income. So they modeled really great financial behavior for me. We didn't overtly talk about it. Like we discussed the stock market here and there. We certainly discussed the real estate. And I remember when they had trouble with tenants and I remember when they had to evict, evict people. So all of this was part of my childhood, but they never sat me down and said, this is compound interest and this is how it works. It was just part of the fabric. So they modeled fabulous financial behavior. And when I became an adult, I saved half of my income. I invested, I bought real estate. The problem was they never taught me the vocabulary to understand what I was doing. So fortuitously, I was doing all the right economic moves, but I had no idea what financial independence was. I had no idea what enough, quote unquote, looked like when it came to money. I just knew what the right steps to take were. So you start taking those steps in terms of your career. You're following in your father's medical footsteps. So you go to medical school, you become a doctor, you start practicing. That's a tough road. That's a long, long committed journey. And then you're doing all these financial things correctly. You're building resources. And at some point, you come to the conclusion that maybe the daily practice of medicine is not what you want to keep doing. That's got to be, first of all, a tough choice. 
with all you have invested in, in time and money and blood, sweat, and tears at that point. So when was your first inkling that maybe you wanted to step away from medicine? What triggered that, and, and what did that look like? It was a process, but I can narrow it down to a single night. I was a second-year resident. I was at Wash U in St. Louis. As a second-year resident in internal medicine, there was a smaller ICU or intensive care unit, and every third night, you were the only doctor on call. So no one more advanced or more trained than you was there. You were left with the 10 or so ICU patients, and come hell or high water, it was your job to take care of them. You could call in backup, but from the moment to moment, you were the only doctor on that unit. A bunch of nurses, a bunch of technicians, but you were the person in charge. A few hours before midnight, the rest of the residents and physicians signed out to me, right? When they leave the ICU, the patients they're taking care of for the day, they tell you about them and then they leave. And one of my fellow residents told me about a patient who was in his 80s, he came in in respiratory distress, he wasn't breathing well, we didn't know why. And the message my fellow resident said, do the best to keep him off a ventilator and we'll figure out what's going on with him in the morning. So everyone leaves and I'm taking care of the other incredibly ill patients on the unit and I start getting messages from the nurses, Mr. So-and-so is doing worse. His breathing is get getting worse. I call the respiratory therapist, I get a chest x-ray. I can't figure out what's going on. At some point, his oxygen levels get so low, I realize I'm going to have to put this person on a breathing tube, a respirator. He can no longer breathe for himself. So in my hospital, the way you do that is you call the anesthesiologist on call because they're the experts in putting a breathing tube in. But we as internal medicine physicians were also trained to do this. So you call the anesthesiologist in case anything goes wrong. You start the process on your own, and you either get the breathing tube in well. It's a manual procedure get the patient on a ventilator, everything's great. And if you have any problems, they usually come in five or 10 minutes, you'll be in the midst of doing it, you're having problems, they'll come help you. So I call the anesthesiologist, I start the procedure, and it's not going well. The breathing tube is going into the esophagus or feeding area as opposed to the respiratory area. The oxygen levels are going down, I have to stop what I'm doing, put oxygen mask on the patient and start breathing them for them with a breathing bag. This goes on for about five minutes. At some point, I'm sweating. I'm scared. Things are really going poorly. And I'm yelling. I'm standing at the patient's bedside dealing with the patient. I'm yelling out at the secretary 20 feet away from me, where's the damn anesthesiologist? They didn't come. And in fact, even though we paged them, they never came. The patient started to crash. I was lucky enough that a fellow resident was walking by. He saw me in distress. He came in. He helped me. We finally got the breathing tube into the right place, into this patient. He was stabilized. A minute later, his heart stops. Wow. We perform CPR. We do everything we can, and he dies. And now let me tell you, you know, I was in my mid to late 20s. I was still learning as a physician. This felt horrible. And of course, I was the only doctor there. So I had to call the family at one in the morning. The whole family's coming in. I, me alone sitting them down in the conference room, telling them, I'm sorry, but your loved one has died. We did everything we could. Strangely enough, the family seemed okay with it. He was in his 80s. They knew he was very sick. They leave. By then, it's 3 in the morning, and I am just rushing to do everything else I need to do for the rest of my patients. Yeah, because you have other critically ill yeah. patients. And the next morning, as we are rounding, and the process of rounding is where you walk around with all the doctors and the chief doctor, and you talk about what happened to each patient at the end of the night. And since I was the doctor on call, I was on the bubble. I had to tell you what was happening with each patient in front of this group of 10 people. I'm in the middle of reporting on all my patients, and the secretary comes in and interrupts our morning rounds. Now, this is highly irregular. They are not supposed to interrupt rounds unless it's a complete emergency. And the secretary says, I think you need to take this phone call. I got on the phone, and what I learned quickly is the patient who died the night before, it was his new family that came in to see him. He actually had three daughters who lived out of town who had no idea what happened because they didn't talk to the other family. So that morning, I had to talk to three young women on the phone who didn't even talk to each other anymore. I had to tell each one of them on the line that their father died, and it was horrible. One was just silent. The other screamed at me. One just broke out into tears. And that 
day changed my life. I mean, I realized somewhere deep down inside that I was standing on the midst of the abyss and I could either fall into it or I could start to build walls to protect myself so that I wouldn't hurt in these kind of situations. And that's exactly what I did. When I started residency, the chief doctor took us around to all the different units in the hospital, and then he brought me to a third-year resident. I was a new or first-year resident named John. And he said, this is John. You're going to take over his patients. Today is his last day. And I'll never forget this. He said, John can't be hurt anymore. And it took me that night in the ICU to realize that what that meant is you could walk into the most difficult situation with patients dying, have a split second to make a decision, and you could make that decision come hell or high water and wake up the next day and do your job regardless of what happened. And so I learned how not to be hurt. The downside of that is not only was I blocking myself with these walls from the outside, I was also holding in all the sadness, fatigue, and trauma that I experienced during training, and I became a different person. I became cold. My family had always known me as a giving, happy person who was always laughing at things, and that persona slowly disappeared as I practiced medicine. I think it would have gone away completely, except in 2004, my son was born. And when I held him in my arms in the delivery room, I quickly realized that those walls were doing me so much harm. And what kind of father would I be to my child or children? What kind of spouse would I be to my wife? I was able to break down those walls. And I started going back into medicine feeling again. And I was able to hold my patient's hands and even cry with them at times. I became a different person, not nearly as guarded, But the damage was done. I already saw the negativity in medicine. And on top of that, as I became an attending physician, I had much more paperwork and I had to deal with the rules of insurance companies and the government. And I found that I was spending a lot of time doing things I didn't like to do anymore. So this burnout built from that day in residency through the years until I got to the point where I felt so burnt out and so broken by the system, all I wanted to do was get out. And so I had all this wonderful financial modeling, and I started asking myself, well, how much money do I need to get away from this profession that's causing me all this pain and burnout? And so I went to my financial advisor. I had a financial advisor at the time, and he did a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations, but, you know, he did something really funny. He said, how much do you want to spend a year? And I had never thought about that. I had never budgeted. We just saved money automatically. Half the money went into investments, half the money we used. I never kept track of it. So I'm like, I'd like to live off of $250,000, $300,000 a year. Well, based on those numbers, his Monte Carlo simulation showed that I had nowhere near enough money to retire. So I just went back to work. And then I asked my accountant, who in this case was my mom. And my mom had no understanding of financial independence. So I said, well, how much money do you think I need to retire from medicine? And she said, $10 million. And I said, why $10 million? And she's like, I think that's what you'd be comfortable with. (laughs) And so I didn't have $10 million It's a nice round number. So all of these things were coming to a head in 2014, where I'd come to terms with the fact that I needed to make a lot more money and that I was nowhere near retirement. And then a funny coincidence happened. A guy named Jim Dolly called my office, and he had just written a book called The White Coat Investor, and I had a pretty successful medical blog at the time where I wrote about medicine and life, and he asked me to review his book for my blog. I reviewed his book, and all of a sudden, within a few hours, he gave me the vocabulary to understand what I had been doing with my finances all those years, and I knew immediately that I was financially independent. Interesting. So now you're at a you're at a junction, right? You you've determined that you're financially independent. You have gone through hell with your your profession, the real dark side, and it's taken you places you didn't want to be. You come back out of them, but it's still kind of taking you at the end. But it seems to me there's a third leg on that stool, and that is that for a lot of people, and maybe particularly for doctors. The identity of being a doctor, the work of being a doctor, the purpose of being a doctor, that's, that, with all that time and effort and training, and maybe even with all 
the trauma that you live through with your with your patients and your family, that's got to be a really intense focused identity, a real, uh, maybe the upside of it is there's no question that you have a purpose in life, right? And now you're talking about walking away from that. Did you, were you aware of, of how important that identity was, how integrated it probably was into your life and, and how big a change walking away? I think you could see clearly from what you're telling the story, you could see the advantage of walking away from those negative things. Clearly, you had determined you could afford to walk away from those negative things. But did you think about that? those identity and purpose things that you would also be given up? You know, it's funny, and this is a major point in the book, Taking Stock. I had blindly accepted the, pers- the purpose and identity that I attributed to my father and his dying as the correct best purpose and identity for me even though there were signs that it wasn't. I identified as a doctor, but I didn't have a lot of doctor friends. I hated hanging out in the doctor's lounge. And when I would go to a party and meet people I had never met before, I found myself shying away because I was afraid they were going to ask what I did for a living. And it gave me shame. And I never understood why. Why is this so shameful to me? It was only later that I realized that being a doctor was an identity that I wore like a cloak on my outsides. But my insides were very different. My insides, I wanted to be a communicator, a podcaster, a writer, a public speaker, all these things that I later found. And all that shame came from the fact that I was being identified on the outside at what didn't fit on the inside. It took me years of self-work to get there. So you're asking about that moment where I realized I was financially free and I could walk away from medicine right away I was jubilant for a very short period of time, meaning hours, and then I became extremely anxious and had a panic attack because I realized that this thing that I identified myself by for my whole life, this being a doctor, the wisp of connection I had to my father who had died when I was a little boy, I all of a sudden could give all that up because it didn't feel good anymore. But then what did feel good? And you were still giving something up, even though it didn't feel good. I mean, it was still a pretty large and powerful thing to step away from. So did anything in medicine resonate with you at that point, or were you just completely done with it? Well, that's where the interesting part comes in. When I realized I was financially independent, there was this pull to quit right away. But then I also realized from that panic attack that something was wrong that I didn't know what my purpose and identity were, and that I needed to do a lot of self-work to figure that out. So instead, I used something I call in the book, the art of subtraction. I started looking at my job and saying, what is creating friction? What don't I like? Instead of throwing the whole thing away, let's whittle it down to the things that are causing me the most anxiety and stress. So the first thing is I was running my own practice and I was on people's beck and call 24 hours a day. And that was exhausting for me. So I got rid of my basic office and home practice, but I kept doing nursing homework. And by this time I was working as a medical director in a hospice and I was doing some other side hustles and those were making me money. And I did that for a while. And then I started thinking, you know, what's really causing me friction in my life. And all that you're doing after you've, had the epiphany that you're financially independent and you don't want to deal with this negative stuff in the medicine. Right. So, okay. So I am, and I'm thoughtfully thinking about what can I subtract from life, which isn't making me happy. So then the next thing was the nursing homework. I was getting called at three in the morning. The patients were extremely sick. I kept on subtracting things out of my work life until I was left with the one thing that I would genuinely do, even if I wasn't getting paid for it. And that was hospice work. So hospice started as a side hustle where I could make a few thousand dollars extra a month by being a hospice medical director, but it ended up being the one thing that still resonated with my sense of purpose and identity. Like I said, it was the thing I would do even if I wasn't getting paid for it, and that was a major flag in my mind. If I would do this even for free, this has real meaning for me. So eventually I got rid of everything but doing that. And you are still doing that today. And I am still doing that today. The really interesting epiphany that came from this is as I got deeper and deeper into hospice and palliative care and taking care of people who were dying, 
I started seeing ways in which it reflected on my personal finance journey and how it how I felt about financial independence. I had no idea there was a connection, but all of a sudden I started realizing, hey, the dying actually have a lot to teach us about money and life. I had never connected the two before. So hold that thought, because that's what your book is about. We're about to delve into your book, but I have one last question about your medical career before we go forward into the book, and that is, would you do it again? Would you go through all that blood, sweat, and tears, time, training, money, would you be a doctor again? And would you recommend it as a career path for others? You know, I have a few answers to that. The, the problem with any profession is you never really know what it is until you're practicing it. And going into medicine takes many years as well as a lot of money and training and blood, sweat, or tears to actually get to the point where you're practicing it. And right. then you can evaluate whether you like it or not. Because what we think most professions are probably isn't what they really are. You know, I'm a big fan of this theory that we tell ourselves the stories about our lives that make it magical. I think that's one of the keys to happiness. So the magical story I tell about my life is if my father hadn't died, I wouldn't have become a doctor. If I wouldn't have become a doctor, I wouldn't have had this chance to affect people's lives in profound ways. And I think that has value. Like whether being a doctor fit my sense of meaning and purpose in the end, it gave me this amazing opportunity to help people and probably discover the part of medicine that does have meaning and purpose for me, which is doing hospice work. So I think I ended up where I am on purpose, and I can't imagine that I'd have the knowledge or wisdom I have today if I hadn't gone through what I went through. Now, all that being said and done, what I talk about a lot in the book is we need to have a sense of meaning and purpose originally before we start working on our financial plan. If I had known today what I know now, especially after writing this book, I probably would have been a lot more thoughtful about meaning and purpose, and I probably would have started my career in hospice work, as opposed to getting to it at the end of my career. Now imagine, if I started my career in hospice work, I probably would have been paid a quarter of what I eventually ended up making by being a business-savvy physician. But... I probably would have had a much longer career where I enjoyed myself more, where every day I really felt like I was identifying with my work and was being very purposeful. Well, on the career you have now. Yeah. And so maybe I wouldn't have got to financial independence until I was 55 and or 60. And maybe it wouldn't have mattered. Because I would have been enjoying every day anyway. <laughs> so let's talk about the book. So the book is Taking Stock. Again, I, I've had the privilege of reading this. I think it's a great book. The the subtitle is A Hospice Doctor Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. It ties two things that maybe on the surface seem not to be related, and that's building wealth and death. And of course, you have insights into both of those things. You've gone on the journey to become financially independent, and you're a hospice doctor. I happen to think those things are very closely related. The, the death and, and financial independence thing. Because our death in an ideal world, it seems to me, informs the way we live. And pursuing financial independence at its core is a fundamental way to organize and to live your life. So for me, it makes, it makes perfect sense. But maybe it's not so obvious. What is the connection? So I would have never thought there was a connection either. But after studying financial independence and realizing that it's fairly prescribed how you get there, there are a few different ways, it's easy to talk about, it's easy to plan for, although it may not be easy to do, right? It takes a lot of advanced planning, it takes saving, it takes investing, but the steps are knowable. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. What's more difficult is trying to figure out why you want to be financial independent, financially independent. The simple answer is so that I'm safe, so that I never have to work again, so that I'm free. I'm free so that I don't die before I run out of money. But in the end, we have to search deeper and say, well, what do I want to do with all that free time I've now won myself, right? We don't actually win free time. Time passes no matter what. But what we do is we free ourselves from other obligations that fill up the time so that we can now fill that time with things that do have meaning and purpose for us. So I got to that point in my financial journey where I was very much past the how and more to the why. 
And I started looking at people who were dying and started saying, well, you know, it's this amazing window when you're told that you're going to die. It distills everything into what was important in my life and what needs to be done before I die. One of the things that I notice in writing for the financial independence community, as I've done for the last decade, is how much fear there is around money and having enough money. Um, so when push comes to shove and, and people are looking, looking uh, death in the face, what do they actually regret? Well, first and foremost, almost no one ever says, I wished I worked more nights and weekends. Almost no one says, you know what, I died with a net worth of a, of a million dollars and I was really, I had a goal of 1.5 and I just didn't get there. Generally, people regret that they didn't have the energy, courage, or time to do the things that were most important for them. And in fact, often, part of the problem is they don't spend a lot of time thinking that, well, about what was most important to them. So I'm sure you're asking as you listen to this, well, why don't we spend the time thinking about what's most important to us? And believe it or not, I think it gets back to our death, our fear of death. I think we're so afraid of dying that to start thinking about what truly has meaning or purpose for you is to come to terms with the fact that life is finite and we may die without reaching our true goals. That's uncomfortable and that's scary. So instead we focus on much lower hanging fruit. And I think money is much lower hanging fruit, right? The answers are simple. I either work harder, I start a side hustle, I invest more aggressively. Like there are answers of how do I become financially independent which are clear. What there aren't answers to is how do I live a life of meaning or purpose? And what if I don't have enough time to get there? And so I think it really ties this idea between the regrets of the dying and the regrets of the living. I think us, the young people, the people who are not terminally ill, could really take some of that clarity that the dying have about what's important and start using that in their day-to-day -day life today to start figuring out what their meaning and purpose are so that then based on that we can build a financial independent structure that meets those needs i think that there's a there's an old saying and i'm probably going to butcher it but that people don't regret the things they did they regret the things they didn't do and so what i hear you saying and and what i agree with is we should be bolder in the things that we choose to do. We should be bolder in the way we live our life. We should be uh, bolder in taking, in taking risks and chances and not worry about it so much. And I think you're right. People are afraid of death and they're so afraid of it, they don't think about it. And by not thinking about it, you lose what it seems to me is an amazing tool. Because when you know you're going to die, and we all are, then being bold is is not as scary. It's not as difficult. And there's a lot more reward in it. We don't regret what we failed. We regret what we didn't try. And let uh, me give yes. you an example. I have a patient who I took care of who in his late 20s, early 30s, decided to go and try to climb Mount Everest. And he took time off of work. And he exercised for a year and he trained and he went to go climb Mount Everest and he made it about halfway up and then the weather changed and they had to turn back. I had the privilege of meeting this gentleman in the 40s when he was dying of leukemia and he regaled me and the hospice nurses with the stories of being up on the mountain and the snow and the wind and the making every step forward and the difficulty that was part of his purpose. And imagine if he hadn't come to terms with that being part of his purpose and decided, you know what, I don't have enough money now. I can do that when I'm 40. For him, when he was on his deathbed, he could say that there was this thing that was totally important for me, part of my purpose, and I tried. There was no regret there. He didn't regret that he failed. He would have regretted if he had never taken the time to try. Well, in a, in a sense, I would argue that it was a failure. I mean, yes, it was a failure in the sense that he didn't get to the top of the mountain, but
but it was a huge success in that he got on the mountain, that he had the experience of being on Everest and, and, and climbing it. And that's, I would guess, one of the reasons he took satisfaction of it. So probably the broadest general conclusion I took from your book is, is the idea of being bolder in our, in our choices and using de- our death as an advisor, if you will, in how we live our, live our life. What other conclusions besides that one should people be, can people expect to find in the book? You know, I think the outline of the book, the easiest way to understand it is part one is trying better to find your meaning and purpose now before you make it to your deathbed. Part two is using that knowledge of your meaning or purpose, decide on a path towards financial independence. And there are a few different paths you can take. And then last but not least, decide what's your biggest fear. Are you afraid that you're going to die young and wealthy without experiencing life? Or are you afraid that you're going to die old but broke? And the reason why that last question is so important is those people who figure they're going to die young and wealthy probably should spend a lot more money on today and YOLO or you only live once. That was kind of your dad. That was exactly my dad who knew he was going to die at the, he knew he was going to die at a young age. He wasn't sure when. So he didn't save a lot of money towards retirement. He spent a lot of time doing things he enjoyed. He loved woodworking. He loved photography. He traveled all around the world. He was learning another language when he died. For him, living in today was really important because he didn't have a lot of time. So for those kind of people, I think their financial independence trajectory, and don't get me wrong, I think everyone should have a financial independence trajectory, but it could have been a very slow and long path to financial independence, maybe not happening to your 60 or 70, but enjoying your days now to the maximum. On the other hand, there are people like me who I always thought I was going to live to an old age, so I wasn't as worried about enjoying today when I was 20 or 30. I was interested in building a career building up wealth and let it compounding because I felt like I was going to live a long time and I would have decades if I saved appropriately and let that money compound in investments. I figured I'd have decades to do what I wanted to do. There's no right or wrong answer, but if you can define your meaning and purpose, if you can start charting out your path to financial independence, this will then help you decide how fast or slow you need to get there. It's the biggest question we have. How do we decide between YOLO, you only live once, and deferred gratification? If you're going to live 100 years, then you better start living, thinking about deferred gratification. If you're going to die at 40 like my dad, you better start enjoying life today. We have no idea which one is the truth. I'm trying to cover all bases. So most of us have to figure out that, that balance. I, I, of course, and anybody who's read my work, I tilt on the side of deferred gratification and buying your freedom. And one of the reasons for that is a freedom is very important to me. But the other reason is that I don't necessarily equate spending money with having great experiences. You can have great experiences spending very, very little money, especially when you're younger. So that's, that's kind of my approach, but your point's well taken. And I think your book covers it well, that there are different approaches that are going to appeal to different people, different personality types, different psychologies, and they can all work. And the important thing that I hear is being intentional about it, actually making a decision. I have frequently said that for me, there was nothing more important to spend my my money on than my freedom, and that meant buying investments. But at the same time, I can understand and even respect somebody who was going to say, you know what, I that's not that important to me. I mean, a fancy house, a fancy car, fancy wardrobe, those things are more important to me. Now, I have trouble understanding that thinking, <laughs> and I have trouble understanding those choices, but it's not my life. And, you know, as long as you are consciously making that choice, and as long as you realize that it's only one of a several choices you could make. And I think things that I, I like about the book is you is you talk about different ways, to very distinctly different ways of of approaching it. So we've all got to define our own purpose and identity and happiness. How do we do that? You know, I think it's a big question and it's probably the most frequent one I get about the book is you talk all the time about purpose, identity and connections well, how do we figure out what our purpose 
identity and connections are. And right. first and foremost, I'll tell you, it's not a perfect process. There are a bunch of exercises in the book that tell you specifically how to go about it. But let's talk about some simple ones. I think when we're talking about purpose, a great way that I learned from my hospice patients is ask yourself, if I had just been told that I have six months or less to live, what would I regret not spending my energy courage or time doing right what are those things that i'll regret that i didn't do and i think it's a great thought exercise of figuring out today what's important to you what you'd want to accomplish if you had a limited amount of time left because you do have a limited amount of time left it might not be six months it might be 60 years and that's what acknowledging the fact you're going to die, that's the gift that your death gives you. Yeah. and The, so, the acknowledgement of your death gives you. So in, in hospice, we do something called a life review, and I spell it out in the book, but maybe doing a year-to-year -year life review and helping you better decide what things you do and spend time on have most meaning to you and finding ways to spend more time doing those things, that's a good start. When it comes to identity, I love to tell people to continuously ask themselves the question, I am, and then fill in the blank. So when I first do this, I remember the first time I did this, I said, I am, and the first thing that came up in my mind is a doctor. And that was my profession. That was something I grew up with. That was your identity. That was my identity. So then I tried to push myself harder. I said, okay, well, a doctor is what you do for a living, but it's not all of what you are. So I said, I am... Next thing I came up with is a husband, a father, a son. I started talking about my familial relationships, which are part of who I am, but they're not the sum total either. After that, I am a Plutus Award winner for my podcast. So I started thinking about my achievements, which again, talk about what I do, but not necessarily who I am. Congratulations for that, by the way. <laughs> you are a fellow Plutus Award winner, so we are, we are sitting together in good company. <laughs> But when I really kept on asking myself, what I came up with is, I am a podcaster, I am a writer, I am a public speaker, I am a communicator. And when I latched onto that identity, a funny thing happened. You see, I had been going to conferences as a doctor, I had been hanging out in the doctor's lounge, I had been trying to make friends with doctors for years, and it never worked. But when I latched on to what I really care about is being a communicator and started looking into things like personal finance, and I started to go to conferences and meeting other communicators, I felt closer in a matter of minutes to these people than I'd ever felt in the doctor world. Well, and now I would suggest, especially with, the, I mean, with your podcast, but especially with Taking Stock, your new book, you are now a guide. And I think that's a pretty cool thing to be in terms of identity. You certainly, uh, you know, your book is, is provided guidance for me, and I suggest that it's going to provide guidance for anybody. I want to, earlier in our conversation, you threw out a term that I want to return to that's also in your book, and that's this idea of subtraction. I think in your book you call it the art of subtraction. What the hell is the art of subtraction? You know what? I love to do an exercise in the book called the reverse lottery test. <laughs> and so here's what the reverse lottery test is. Imagine that tomorrow you looked at your lottery ticket and you just won $100 million. More money than you would ever know what to do with. Here's the question. What over the next week or month or year would you stop doing? Would you stop cleaning the toilet? Would you stop showing up for work? Would you stop mowing the lawn? What are those things that, given an unlimited amount of money, would you subtract or get rid of from your life? And in fact, I would say, let's sit down and make a list. Get rid of whatever the top 10 things you get rid of, right? Now, forget it. I just took all that $100 million away. <laughs> Rats. Let's look at your schedule over the next week or two. How much of your time are you spending doing things you would get rid of? And it's a really powerful thing in two ways. One, you can say, boy, I'm spending 50 or 75% of my day doing things I just don't like because I feel like I have to. That's part one. Part two is, what's really interesting is, if I'm spending 75% of my day doing things I don't like doing, what am I spending that other 25% on? 
Do I like doing that? And how maybe could I shift that balance to be 50-50 or even 25-75? Could I move from one job to another company because I don't like how this company is treating me? Could I stay within this company but maybe shift from one set of responsibilities to another set of responsibilities? Could I go part-time realizing that I won't be able to retire for 10 or 15 years more than I thought I could, but it'll give me that space in my life today to really start enjoying things and maybe even out that mixture to 50-50 as opposed to being 75-25. The point is until we're clear about what's giving us friction in our life, what we don't like doing, until we're clear on what that is, we can't start finding ways to shift away from those things and doing things that have more meaning or purpose for us. You know, I love this idea that there are these people out there who wanted to get away from their work life. They had a so-so job, they were tired of doing it, so they saved, they saved, they saved, they ended up financially independent, quote unquote, and then they went home and they fired their maid, and they (laughs) fired their lawn service, and they spend all their time cleaning their toilet and doing the lawn, things they hate. And I look at them and say, well, you, you didn't love work, but you certainly didn't hate it. And now I liked it better than cleaning the toilet. And now to save money because you want to be financially independent, you're doing things you don't like. I say forget who's paying you and who isn't paying you. Let's just take a moment thinking about how we want to spend our time and then again be intentional. So how can we subtract those things out of our life, whether we are struggling to put dinner on the table tonight or whether we are already financially independent? We can still start thinking about what we want to keep and subtract from our lives and start working on how we can do that and still meet our financial needs. I think it's a brilliant concept because most people don't do it. And if you don't do it, if you don't think about this intentionally, then almost by default, you wind up spending your days on things that either you actively don't like or that aren't really all that important to you or just happen to come your way and not because you particularly want to be engaged with them. And I think it takes some effort and thought to turn that around and and really think about that so you don't let those things into your life and you create the space for the things that you do want in your life. I think we misunderstand the concept of All work. due respect to people like to mow their lawns, by the way. Exactly, because plenty yes. of people do. And plenty I, of people do. I think we misunderstand this concept of work. We feel like if we work for other people, it's bad. And if we work for ourselves, it's good. I say throw away all those concepts. You're going to work your whole life. How can we take more control of whatever kind of work you're doing? One of my hospice patients who died of emphysema, he was a dishwasher for a living. And he saved money over years and years and years so he could stop being a dishwasher. In his 60s, he went home and guess how he spent most of his time? Cooking, cleaning, and doing his own dishes. He Every time he was doing his dishes, he was doing work. One way is he was doing work for an employer in which he was getting paid for. Another way, he was doing work for himself so that he didn't have to employ someone else to do it for him. But you know what he came to when he did his life review? The relationships and time spent with people at his job actually enriched his life more than he thought. And this whole concept of work and I have to escape work actually clouded the fact that he was happier being amongst people doing the work of dishes at his job in the restaurant. He was much happier doing that than doing the work of doing dishes at home when he was alone. Well, there's a lot of value and satisfaction in in work. I think to a certain extent in our culture, it's become a bit of a dirty word. But speaking for myself and for most people that I've met in the FI community, work is extraordinarily satisfying. Now, having autonomy in the work you choose is, is makes an enormous amount of difference. And I think that's where the distinction gets muddled. People tend to think of work as something they don't choose and they don't like and they don't see the value in it. And unfortunately, that probably describes a lot of the work that a lot of people do. In fact, you know, there's a there's a little controversy about the whole fire thing, retire early, and people quit their, you know, they reach financial independence, they quit their jobs, they, re, they quote unquote retire early, and then they go on to do other things. And the Internet Retirement Police is... Uh, as uh, Mr. Money Mustache labeled them, then immediately said, well, you're not actually retired. And, of course, technically that's true. They're not. What they've 
transition from is work they didn't like to work that they find valuable. But I think work is more satisfying than almost anything else you can do if it's work that you've been able to choose yourself. And this is why I like that concept of the art of subtraction, because in a sense, it's trying to bring autonomy to a situation where you may not feel like you have autonomy. So people say, I have to work. I have to make enough money. I've got to put food on the table. I've got to save. All those things may be true. But is there some autonomy in your day-to-day life in which you can start making that work more gratifying, but not necessarily paying you less to do that? So maybe like your dishwasher friend who has a a job that is perhaps not the most meaningful kind of work that one could have, but stepping back from that and saying, well, okay, I, I have this work that I do. It's not perhaps all that engaging for me, but there are other values that it brings into my life, the camaraderie of the people that I work with, that I get to hang out with, that I enjoy, maybe the satisfaction of doing this job, even though it would be considered a menial job in in most quarters, but the satisfaction of doing it well, I think, is a satisfaction in and of itself. I I remember I've had those kinds of jobs. I've actually been a dishwasher, and I've had those kinds of jobs, and I took satisfaction in, in doing them well, and a great camaraderie with the people I worked with. So, there's lots of different ways to find satisfaction in, in your work. And there's probably nothing that is more satisfying. So, going back to your book, at the end of each chapter, you make us do exercises. <laughs> I don't know that I like that. Why, why do I have to do exercises at the end of each chapter? So you don't have to do the exercises. Here's the oh, reason. Good. <laughs> here's the reason I put those exercises in. I feel like we do a lot of philosophical talking in this book, and I wanted to make sure that people didn't walk away saying, "Okay, I understand the philosophy, but how the heck do I start? How do I figure out meaning and purpose? How do I build towards financial independence? How do I make a better use of my time?" I wanted to make sure that I gave some exercises that got into the nitty-gritty of taking that philosophy and putting it into action in your life. I wanted these bigger, deeper thoughts to be actionable for the people reading the book. So I contemplated this a lot, and funny enough, it probably is the thing I get the most compliments on by my early readers, which was not necessarily intentional. Because at first I thought, this is just going to be something that will take the philosophy and allow them to integrate it into an action plan. But I think the process of doing that will hopefully give people some concrete steps to take next. So I think you've answered the question I was going to ask next. And that is, what do you hope you accomplish with this book? So certainly, that's one of the things that I assume you hope you accomplish. But anything else that you want to share with us on that? So my real hope is that this book helps people. It's taken me a lot of time and angst and years to get to the age of 48 where I'm finally starting to understand what the role money and wealth should really play in our lives. Not everyone has the privilege of taking care of dying people. And that is an insight. It's something we all agree that adds layers of detail and philosophy to everyday occurrences that most of us don't even think about. So I want to take this privileged view, this knowledge I've got from dealing with people at a very difficult point in their lives, and then use it to better inform why we do what we do financially. For us to make money a tool instead of a goal, and a tool that ultimately makes us feel more fulfilled and contented. And if I can help people get there faster to understand better, and to use this knowledge they would never know of unless they happen to read a book written by a doctor who deals with hospice patients, I want to give them all that insight, that insight that I've been privileged to experience by having fallen into this role as a hospice physician. I'm a financial guy. I'm an investment guy. So what can people, let's focus on that as we're winding up our conversation here, what can people do today to make their financial lives better. 
So I would tell you that before they even think of their financial lives, you need to start doing some of these exercises to work on your sense of purpose and identity. I think once you get there, then it's time to start thinking about financial independence and deciding which path towards financial independence is correct with you. So we didn't talk about this much here, but I talk about the parable of the three brothers in this book, and it goes through what I consider the three main ways of getting to financial independence. So once you understand your meaning and purpose, the next thing to do is start working on your financial independence journey, which is to decide which path is right for you, and then you can... Start taking the first steps to jumping into that path. Real quickly, tell, tell me about the three brothers. I, I had forgotten that parable. Shame on me for not asking you earlier. But in the few minutes we have remaining, just a real quick tell me. So the three brothers parable is once there were three brothers who all embarked on the path of a lifetime. The eldest brother didn't like the path, put his head down, and tried to finish as soon as possible. He finished his path way earlier than the other brothers, and so he had years and years of freedom left, although he was a little tired and run down from working so hard. The second brother wanted to finish his path just as fast as the first brother, but he had nowhere near the same amount of stamina. So every once in a while, when he got really tired out, he would go take a flight of fancy into the woods, up in the mountains, get some refreshing free time. Then he would come back and start on the path again. He got to the end of his path a little bit later than the first brother, but maybe he had a little more energy, a little less time to enjoy that freedom, but a little more energy. And last but not least, the young brother was nothing like his two other brothers. He loved the path. He would take his time looking up at the trees, enjoying the breeze, taking a rest whenever he felt like it. The youngest brother got to the end of his path a long time after the first two brothers. And when he got there, the first, the other two brothers were waiting for him. He did something that they couldn't quite understand. He turned around and started walking back the way he came. So what does this have to do with financial independence? Well, the eldest brother is a lot like us early fire practitioners, jail, like you and J.D. Roth and Mr. Money Mustache. Actually, I'm, I'm more like the middle brother, but keep going. Basically, we worked really hard, made a lot of money, we front-loaded the sacrifice, we invested our money, and then let that support us. That's kind of the eldest brother. The middle brother is more passive income, side hustles, mini retirements. They do some work. They find work that maybe is a little more gratifying than the eldest brother. And they find ways to make enough money each month through passive income to cover their monthly needs. And the minute they can get to that point, they're financially independent, maybe even faster than some of the other brothers. The youngest brother is more like the passion play. This is the person who loves creating art or architecture or who can find a job that fulfills their sense of meaning and purpose. If you're 22 years old, you come out of college and you are an architect and you are excited about going to work every day and that gives you meaning and purpose in life and it also produces enough money to cover your daily expenses, you are financially independent from the age of 22. Yes, you're going to need life insurance. Yes, you're going to need disability insurance. You're going to need to protect yourself. But pretty much, if your life fulfills your sense of meaning and purpose and you can make enough money doing that, you are financially independent. So three different ways, front-loading the sacrifice, side hustle and passive income, or the passion play. Once you know your meaning and purpose, you can then set out to decide which pathway feels best to you. And then, of course, that last question we talked about before is, are you afraid you're going to die too early and not be able to spend all your money? Or are you afraid that you're going to live too long and run out of money? And that will tell you how fast you have to walk the path of the brothers. We, we could do a whole podcast talking about the, the various brother, brother passes. And speaking of the podcast, so I, I imagine most of the people listening to this are familiar with the Earn and Invest podcast. Uh, that's why they've turned out. But in the off chance that there are some listening that for whom this is a new experience, first of all, you'll be glad to know I am not always the host. Usually, usually Doc G is doing the interviewing. I couldn't ask for a better guest than, than having Doc G, but he has uh, fabulous guests and does a great job interviewing them. So talk a little bit about before we part company here, the Earn Invest podcast and maybe even how it, it meshes in with the new book, Taking Stock. So the Earn and Invest podcast is basically, hopefully, the Financial Independence 201. So the 101, and there's tons of great podcasts and blogs that talk about the 101, is how we get there. And the 201, I want to delve more into those conversations of why and what next. So what I always try to bring on are experts 
or people who have interesting life pathways, and they can tell us not only how they got to a point of wealth or financial independence, but what then they are doing with it. What does quote unquote enough mean to them and how it plays out in their life? You know, the book Taking Stock is informed by these conversations. It's informed by the conversations I have with my hospice patients. It's all about how we can use money as a tool to live the life we want to. Well, I have my copy of the book, and I'm honored that you brought me a copy of it. You sent me an advanced copy, as we, we talked about earlier, a manuscript, really, that I had the privilege to read early. You actually brought me the actual printed book with a lovely note inside, which I, which I very much appreciate, so I have an autographed copy of the book. So I am taken care of here, but for those people who are listening to us who do not have a copy of the book, when is it available and how do they find it? So Taking Stock, Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life is available August 2nd, which will be tomorrow, when if we drop this po- <laughs> podcast episode when we are supposed to. It can be found anywhere you find books, especially on Amazon. Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, you name it, it is there. If you have any questions and are not sure where to find it, certainly you can go to jordangrummet.com, that's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com, or to earnandinvest.com. There will be plenty of links at both those places to set you off on your path to take stock. Doc, thank you. Thank you for letting me hijack your podcast once again. This is not the first time I've done this. It's always fun, at least for me, to do it. Thank you for creating the podcast and for all the great interviews you do. I've been privileged to be a guest and be under your hot lights. And finally, uh, thank you for for writing a great book and what I think is an important book and a great addition to the canon of of the world of of FI. I'm honored to be able to interview you about it and have have a small, I feel like I have a small piece of it myself. So thank you. I appreciate it, and many of my ideas and theories about financial independence are informed by you, a yearbook, Simple Path to Wealth, as well as your blog, jlcollinsnh.com. So I wanted to thank you for your contribution. I couldn't be where I am today without reading your words. Well, that's that's very kind, and I, as long as you as you said that, I, I'm going to be bold and. And I'm going to share with people the note you put in with your uh, autograph on the copy of the book you gave me. I, I am, I'm, I'm so touched by this. He says, for JL, I couldn't wish for a better friend and mentor. Thanks for helping me, quote, take stock, unquote, of my life. Jordan, I, um, you touched my heart, and I appreciate it. And that, boys and girls, is a wrap. So, before we stop recording entirely, in case there are actually show notes after that, I I have to tell a quick story I didn't want to tell in the middle of our interview, and that's the story of why I no longer buy lottery tickets. (laughs) So, to tell that story, I have to tell you, first of all, why I used to buy lottery tickets, because I am financially and mathematically savvy enough to know that it is a very stupid thing to do. The odds are so infinitesimally small that you are going to win that you are truly setting your money on fire. You're, there, there's few more effective ways to throw away money than buying a lottery ticket. You would be just as well served to take your $5 bill, because when I used to buy them, I would buy $5 worth, and set it on fire. But one of the things that I got by buying a lottery ticket rather than setting that $5 bill on fire is the fantasy value of thinking about what I would do with the hundred million. And of course I only bought when it went up to stupid, stupid levels. But then I started reading more and more about how much unhappiness winning the lottery actually brought to those handful of people who won it. And it's really pretty appalling. And so I, I, it started to become less and less appealing. And I, I stopped buying it for that reason because the fantasy value just sort of ran out 
And then I started to think, you know, I'm actively not going to buy lottery tickets because it would be so horrible to win this money. It would bring so much misery into my life that I don't even want to take the infinitesimally small chance for the fantasy value. And of course, the fantasy is to, you know, make the fantasy whatever you want to be. But I don't want to buy a lottery ticket to have that fantasy value because there is this infinitely small chance that I might actually win the damn thing and bring all this misery into my life. So that's why I don't buy lottery tickets. I love it. I love it. 